Well, welcome. And this is a, a combination presentation and discussion. Uh, this is um, what is the NSF ATE program and how can you support, uh, uh, get support uh, to develop a successful proposal? So uh, luckily you have four presenters here and uh, Celeste Carter, who's there, uh, Celeste, you wanna wave there. Uh, she is the program director uh, and lead for the ATE program in the Division of Undergraduate Education. As you can see, she has a wonderful background. Uh, and, um, and so I'll let you read that because I'm gonna introduce each of the presenters and get to our material. Uh, so Karen Wazina Birch is our next uh, presenter, and uh, Karen is the uh, principal investigator uh, for our manufacturing center in Connecticut. Karen, you want to go away there? Yeah. And you can hey, everybody. Okay. And actually, I see a former colleague, Krista. I wanted to at least say hello to, do a shout out. Great. Uh, and uh, all right, um, my name is Kathleen Alfano. I'm a professor emeritus from uh, College of the Canyons. And I'm also, as you can see, fairly active still. And uh, I'm uh, especially the co-PI of uh, uh, the ATE Center Create uh, for Renewable Energy and uh, the PI and co-PI on two Mentor Up grants, which we'll be talking about. Last but not least, we have uh, Elizabeth Tellis, uh, who uh, was one of the uh, founders of the ATE program and co-lead for ATE for a long time. And Liz, do you wanna give a wave? Here you go. All right, <laughs> you can see that we have a strong team and um, we're going to go through a number of topics. Uh, so you've had your introduction. We're gonna have a welcome and overview uh, by Celeste Carter. And she's going to give us an update on the status of ATE funding, as far as uh, she knows, and um, mention the new solicitation, which is coming up. And then um, we're going to talk about the process for applying for a mentoring grant. If you'd like help in writing a grant, uh, Karen Birch is going to do that. And then I'm going to follow up with uh, uh, more about that. And then Elizabeth Tellis is going to uh, talk about uh, if you would like help, you're not quite ready to apply for Mentor Up, but you'd like maybe a one page uh, read uh, and uh, as an intermediate step, we're even willing to do that. And then we're going to spend most of the time on your questions. With that, I'm handing it over to Celeste Carter. All right. Well, thank you. Welcome, everyone. And uh, I'm going to try and keep this brief because you guys can always go online and read more about the ATE program. But this is a program that was uh, actually started uh, based on legislation in 1992. It was the Scientific and Advanced Technologic Education um, uh, Bill that was signed into law. And what that, what that did, that uh, uh, piece of legislation was um, mandate to the National Science Foundation that they develop a program that focused on two-year institutions of higher education. So that's our community and technical college system in the United States to focus on the education of technicians for any high technology field or advanced technology field that would, that, are, that would be driving our nation's economy. The idea was, was how, do we, how do we stay globally competitive? Um, we need a highly skilled workforce. So that's really this, uh, the ATE program is that's really the focus of it. And I think, Kathy, I probably have to ask you to advance the slide. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so this is really just a, a snapshot look at ATE, which really focuses on workforce readiness. And um, it, we're, we're, we're looking for innovative strategies to grow that skilled technical workforce. The skilled technical workforce name came about when the National Academies did a study just a few years back and, uh, and they, they started the project calling it that they were going to look at middle skills. So some people know middle skills. Um, they decided that some people in their, in their research, some people found that middle skills just didn't really ring right uh, to them. They, they didn't see that. You, some people call it blue collar STEM workforce. Other people don't like that name. So the Academy said, we think skilled technical workforce is, is, is the way to go. And it's really been that that name has been pretty well ex accepted. So what would that be? That would be the workforce that generally has more than a high school degree 
but less than a baccalaureate degree. So you can see why the skilled technical workforce falls within the purview of the two-year institutions of higher education. So we, we look to the two-year institutions to provide innovative leadership uh, in partnership. So if you notice on the left-hand side, we've got industry and then workforce investment boards. You could put economic development agencies in there. We want strong public-private um, uh, partnerships. We want industry to be working with the two-year programs so that the product of the program, the students graduating with could be certificates, could be associate's degrees, uh, could be you know, uh, certifications, industry validated certifications, but it's, it's enabled and informed by the industry partnership. And along with this, you, know, you can see then why a workforce investment board or an economic development agency would be important in a regional area. Um, it, for example, I, I developed and led a biotechnology program in the San Francisco Bay Area at Foothill College. Uh, there are approximately 1,200 biotechnology um, companies in that area, many of them small startups going all the way up to you know, Genentech, Amgen, that sort of the biggies. Um, but notice on the bottom that another thing that, that um, the legislation said was, this, this program could also support grades seven through 12. So I have high schools there, dips a little lower than that, and four-year institutions. So the idea being that a skilled technical workforce, you may, you may finish, get an associate degree, go into industry, and then in essence hit a ceiling. And it's nice to know that there are articulated pathways where you could continue your education at the four-year. Um, going the other way in high schools, we have quite a portfolio of dual credit uh, opportunities for high school students so that while they're in high school, they're actually getting credit both at high school and within a two-year institution of higher education. So, so that's really kind of a snapshot of ATE. Um, you can see that for fiscal year 21, I have in parentheses $75 million. That was the funding for the program last year in fiscal year 20. Um, as you know, uh, we, we did have the president sign off on the legislation for the funding for the federal government, but that now starts sort of a, a back and forth um, between the National Science Foundation and the Office of Management and Budget as to how the funds that are appropriated will, will be sort of divvied up across the foundation. So I put that in parentheses, assuming that we will have the, approximately the same funding that we had last year. Um, so that's a real brief snapshot. If, if you are interested in more, you can look for the solicitation. Um, it is, uh, it, it, the current solicitation has, has lapsed. And as Kathy said, I, what I, I wanted to tell you, we will, be, we, we will be and are working on a new solicitation. I can't really say much about it. We're not really allowed to until it is formally published. Um, I can tell you that the solicitation has to be published 90 days prior to the submission date for proposals. And our calendar is that we are looking for proposals to be submitted in the, on the first Thursday in October of this year, 2021, which would be October 7th. So latest you could, you know, latest we're, we're working and, and we're working to get it done before that would be 90 days prior to October 7th. So, um, so, so that's, uh, I think, I think that that pretty much covers, I don't know, Kathy, was there anything else I was, uh, you wanted me to, to go over? Well, we'll have to see with questions. I'm sure they'll okay. have questions for you. All right. Well, let me then turn it back to you and we'll move on because I want to have the time for the questions. Great. Thank you, Celeste. So if you've heard these excellent presentations today uh, or you had some ideas, how do you go from your idea or your need to a successful ATE award? Uh, so one of the things we're suggesting is that you seek out one of the mentoring programs that NSF ATE funds. Uh, we're going to talk about one of them today, but if you have uh, questions, again, we've offered to look at your idea and we can tell you if you fit uh, to mentor up or another program. Uh, so we're happy to help and you'll have your our emails at the end. So mentor up is a grant uh, that uh, NSF ATE has funded. Uh, to increase the number of competitive NSF ATE proposals submitted 
uh, by two-year faculty through a faculty development program incorporating usually in-person, but uh, last year virtual, this year virtual uh, workshop and virtual mentoring uh, in how to develop successful projects. What's unique about MentorUp? Because you might have heard of MentorLinks, MentorConnect, MentorUp. There's a lot of mentoring programs, or there's several. Uh, so MentorUp is unique in that uh, we're not limited to just small new projects uh, like uh, MentorConnect. We mentor both small new projects, large projects, including the instrumentation acquisition. Uh, you can already have an ATE grant uh, and be mentored. So. Um, and again, we will give you feedback on your idea, especially if you send it now when it's a, uh, more of a quiet time. You send it right before the deadline that we're trying to finalize the group, uh, April 1st, then uh, you're less likely to get good feedback. So uh, ideas sent uh, early are uh, going to get some good feedback and maybe you can develop a, into a proposal to apply. Why would you want to apply? Well, here's an in-person one, but we, we have discussions. Uh, one of the reasons, okay, you can get a, a stipend. Uh, so we're going to be doing online again this year. And uh, so that's $500 for each of two faculty at your college uh, who complete the workshop. And then another $250 each for each of the faculty uh, for submitting the proposal before October 1st. When I say faculty, one of them has to be a faculty, but it could be your second person is an administrator or is a counselor or a recruiter, someone else that can be part of your team. Uh, so uh, it has to be somebody who logically can help you with that project. Uh, and uh, for location, we're not going to have a physical location. We're going to be Zoom again. That'll be June 14th to 16th uh, in 2021 due to the COVID pandemic. So why apply? What will you be provided that you wouldn't have otherwise? Well, each faculty team in college will be assigned a mentor with experience in mentoring and in the ATE program. We have very experienced mentors. Um, there'll be pre-questions, so we help you think out everything so that you can make the best of that two and a half day virtual workshop. We have post-workshop support by mentors and a leadership team. We have uh, five mentor uh, webinars. Some of the mentors are doing it. Some outside people will do them uh, on uh, topics that are uh, very detailed, like budget and evaluation. Uh, for those who request it and have uh, at least 80% complete by September, uh, we also will review your draft proposal and give you feedback, uh, which is very valuable because it gives you another uh, eye outside your college to revise it and uh, make it better. And then uh, we give you support, uh, negotiation support. And I, I'm happy to say uh, out of our uh, group uh, from last year, we already are, have three of our mentee colleges in negotiations, uh, and this is pretty early. Uh, so uh, we will be uh, doing these uh, by Zoom and not in person at the workshop. Uh, and so Karen is gonna talk about the application process. Karen, I think you're on mute. I guess that tagline is going to continue into 2021, right? Yeah. <laughs> Seem to be the one for 2020. Um, I did want to actually also acknowledge um, Elaine Craft and Emery DeWitt who are participating today. They, oh, they, um, yeah. So welcome because they were instrumental in creating this mentoring program called Mentor Connect that um, I think Kathy and myself have been involved with as well as Liz. So I do want to acknowledge them because they're still a great resource and we're all in this together. So um, again, thanks for joining this evening. So the mentor application process, the registration is open now. Um, we're saying that preference will be given to applications received by April 1st. However, um, if you apply after that date, if there's still room and you have an appropriate um, idea that uh, passes the muster, so to speak, um, and unfortunately, that's my puppy who wants to submit a proposal, but we don't do anything right now with um, K9. We'll have to talk to Celeste about that. But anyway, um, if you submit it earlier, the real plus there too is that we're going to give you feedback. Um, I know a couple of the applications we already have scheduled um, follow up calls to discuss what is being proposed and, and really what ways that we can give them some direction on making a successful competitive proposal. 
Um, the applications can be found at the atementorup.org. Um, and here are the basic requirements. A one-page pre-proposal describing a potential ATE project and a letter of commitment from an academic administrator at the level of a dean or above to ensure that you have institutional support for the grant writing and submission, and actually also its implementation, assuming it is awarded. Next slide, please. Um, so this actually, I just said the one-page pre-proposal. Um, be sure to take a look at the solicitation, even though the solicitation um, that is now available you know, has expired, a lot of the content in terms of the whole objective and mission of ATE is not going to change. So, you know, the focus is on workforce development. We are going to be looking to at industry support. Um, so I just want to make sure that one of the things you will hear over and over and over is to read the solicitation, read the solicitation, use that as basically um, a Bible in terms of giving you some direction on how you want to craft this uh, competitive grant. Um, and again, as Les said, a new solicitation will be um, coming out at least 90 days before the first Thursday of October, we hope. Um, but regardless, um, there's, there's, there's a real advantage to taking a look and reading the existing solicitation. Um, so just jump to the second uh, bullet. The pre-proposal should identify the faculty are involved, the target population for your activities, brief description of the um, project itself, alignment to the goals of the ATE program, and again, the emphasis on ATE grants is workforce need, so you want to make sure that you address the workforce need for the particular project that you're proposing that you would like to um, write a grant for. Next, next slide, please. So the letter of commitment, one of the reasons why we really emphasize having this letter of commitment is that it's very difficult to do these grants, first of all, to write them, but also to implement them if you are the lone soldier. So you wanna have institutional support, you know, that are gonna be there, that's gonna help you with the different things that go into submitting a proposal. Because even if you were to do the academic component of the proposal, you know, you still need somebody from your finance department to be able to help with the budget you need an SRO, there's all other little details with something as basic as making sure your institution is registered with National Science Foundation, that anyone who wants to be a PI or co-PI, they also have to have, um, you know, an NSF uh, ID. So those are the kinds of things that the real advantages of these mentoring initiatives is that we'll be telling you at the get-go, these are things you need to get in place so that hopefully in the midnight hour when you're trying, which hopefully you're not gonna do, when you're trying to submit this proposal, you go to find out, and this actually happened with one of my mentees very recently where the who, people they wanted to make co-PIs didn't have NSF IDs and they couldn't get them in time to include them as um, co-principal investigators on the cover sheet. So, you know, it's the things that we, we will keep warning you about and asking you to do. And um, sometimes if you're new to writing an NSF grant, um, it's a whole new um, environment and, you know, it's a real education, let's just say it that way. Next slide. So the selection process, the final selection for participation in the workshop will be determined um, by looking at the actual submission of the pre-proposal and the support letter, how the project aligns to ATE goals and purposes, the quality of the one-page pre-proposal, and your letter of recommendation and pre-proposal will be uploaded, um, or you need to do that through the application form using the link that was on the earlier slide. Next slide. So the context for the um, mentor up application, um, are myself and the two co-PIs. So those are uh, listed there, are our email addresses. Um, but again, I, I would just strongly suggest you going to the website, look at the application and um, you know our contact information is there as well. Next slide. So this is a quick summary. I don't know if I need to go through this all over again, but again, you'll have access to all these PowerPoint slides. So my suggestion would be, you know, go back to these, you know, just like you would probably advise your students to do so. Um, I don't really think I need to go through all the bullets again, but this is available. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to, I think Kathy wanted to do this slide. Yeah, um, 
So I do want to mention that uh, I sent uh, in resources that you'll have access to uh, for this conference uh, a bigger slide deck. Uh, in fact, we had a really big one that explained all the mentoring programs and had the links and everything. And then we heard that we were going to do a small group discussion uh, and less slides. So you'll have all those resources or you can contact us, but um, they said to make it more focused. Uh, so uh, we're, we're just showing you snippets, but there's more resources that you could look at uh, with a bigger slide deck. Uh, so there's many uh, uh, past participants who have had uh, awards uh, that we could uh, have you talk to if you like. Uh, so if you're interested in being mentored in 2021, as I said, we have a group uh, that we're uh, going to start accepting applications for that uh, will start in uh, uh, as soon as we get them, we'll start working with them and then they'll have a June uh, workshop uh, and they'll work with them in the summer and hopefully submit a grant in October. Uh, so if you're interested in that timeline, then uh, please uh, contact one of us or just go right up to the website and uh, it says apply at atementorup.org and we will go ahead uh, and see that you have applied and we'll contact you and look and give you feedback for your proposal. Uh, so, questions. Uh, we, we're on record and so if you have questions that might help other people, uh, you know, you might bring them up. There's not a lot of us on here because we were the one of the last groups. Uh, but um, we could have a discussion about, you know, what might help people. And we have Elaine Craft here who is with one, you know, one of the, uh, I guess the oldest mentoring program. I don't know if Mentor Links is older or not, but it, Mentor Connect has a lot of strong cohorts that they've been through. This is our fifth year. And uh, how many years uh, have you been doing Mentor Connect, uh, Elaine? How many cohorts have you had? Uh, we're starting our ninth cohort this yeah. month. Mm -hmm. yeah, congratulations. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, we have resources here for uh, two of the mentoring programs, and uh, we work together. Like I said, if you send something in to uh, one of us and it's more appropriate for the other, uh, we will uh, send things back and forth. Uh, so uh, any questions? Cheryl, do you, do you have any questions? Pick on you. You're the only one who's not presenting, I think, except Elaine. <laughs> I really, I don't have questions. Um, I didn't really know about this program, so I'm really glad to hear about it. So, so this is Celeste. I, I would like to say something, which is, um, I hadn't thought about it, and I wanted to do this very short introduction, but I thought another thing that everybody's always interested in is, you say, well, why do this, right? Well, you can get mentored to craft a proposal. Well, what does it mean in terms of money? What, what are the award amounts that you would get? Uh, it depends on the size of your project and your institution. If the institution is truly new to the ATE program, so a, a proposal from your institution has not been submitted within the past seven years from the start of a project, you are new and you could craft a fairly small directed project where you could get funding for up to $300,000 over th a three year period. Um, if you have a bigger scope project, a full proposal can go up to $600,000 over a three-year period. And we also have that instrumentation acquisition part to the um, project track. And that's one where you may have a very successful, uh, let's say, HVAC program or uh, building management uh, construction uh, program, but you know that um, you've been talking to some of the people that have hired your, your graduates and they're saying, you know, you guys were great for a while, but you're starting to fall apart on some of the advanced technology stuff that's going on in this field. Instrumentation acquisition, excuse me, gives you the chance to purchase that instrumentation that gets you back up to speed with your potential certainly your industry partners and the potential employers for your students. So there's a lot of different ways you can use the ATE program. And I just wanted to get that in. So I'll turn it back over to Kathy. Yeah, I can give you an example. Um, we, Bridgerland uh, came in uh, as a, a small new, I believe, and uh, had a successful grant in Utah. 
And uh, then we mentored them. Um, I don't know if we mentored them or Mentor Connect mentored them uh, with the first group, but the the uh, they came in with a, us to do an instrumentation acquisition grant, and uh, they got that. So uh, uh, so sometimes uh, you know people will say, well, you were already mentored maybe a few years ago, and. Uh, uh, and uh, there's a couple programs to help uh, people go to that next step because what we found with our program, and I think Elaine has one too, that um, that sometimes you you still need a helping hand to get to that next level of a larger project. Uh, and sometimes by the time that you're going to a larger project, you've got new partners, you have um, both on your campus and uh, in your um, uh, you know, with, with your industry. So, uh, so, you know, it's really a whole different case that you, you sure would like a helping hand and get some feedback. And we're open to that. So, so Peter, just, Peter just posted a question, uh, which is what are the components of a strong, and I would also put in the word competitive ATE proposal? And, and I use a slide where I, I basically, um, along with uh, Liz Tellis, the other person who worked with her on developing the ATE program was um, Dr. Gerhard Salinger. And uh, um, Dr. Salinger would say, if you can cover five points in your proposal preparation and, and crafting a proposal, you're, 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 gonna, you're gonna craft a competitive proposal. And the first one was, is um, you describe the need so that's, that's based on you and your industry partners talking about what industry is not potentially seeing, where are the, where are the gaps, what are the, you know, what, what, what are the skills and competencies that, that need to be infused into your program potentially for this project. Um, number two, do you actually have the people with the right skills to actually carry out the project? Do you have the right faculty? I know I got a, a program officer talking to me this morning saying, you know, um, institute, this institution wrote a great proposal, but they actually don't have a faculty member to teach this, this disciplinary industry area. And they're talking about hiring an adjunct. How do I, how do I negotiate that? Because it reviewed really well, um, such that the institution commits to keeping either the person they hire or somebody with equivalent expertise so that the program doesn't die at the end of the award period. So that would be number two, expertise. Um, number three is, what are you gonna do? What are your activities? What are your, what are your objectives? What, you know, what, what, what are you actually gonna do to, to actually support and, and fill that need that was the first point? Um, next, next point would be, um, how will you know if you're successful? Uh, that's, and that's really, um, Terrell is on, and that's really an evaluation question, really. Uh, uh, what, what, what are you gonna do to assess, do students learn uh, better? Do they gain more skills? You know, what, how, how do you go about doing that? Is it just a pre and post test? Do you need focus groups with students to find out where they're, where they're missing various concepts? That's something for working with an evaluator and coming up with that kind of a, a model for you to understand what, what, what you're gonna do in going forward. And then finally, um, ATE, every single one of us contribute to this program. Maybe not a lot of money, but we all pay taxes. I'm assuming we all pay taxes. And um, ATE is funded with federal taxpayer money. So how are you going to get the word out beyond your institution and your industry partners about what you have learned and what you've done? Maybe you've developed a whole new program in um, construction management for high efficiency buildings. Uh, there's probably a lot of other people in the United States that would like to know what has been developed. So that's at number five point, how will you disseminate the information? And according to Gearhart, and I would agree, that's a competitive proposal. Yeah, I, I would like to add that uh, whatever kind of uh, mentoring you get, uh, mentoring is helpful because you, a lot of times you'll assume that people understand what you're saying. You're writing your proposal. And one of the things that, that each of us will do uh, either uh, as a group uh, with workshops, uh, with each section of the grant, and also by looking at your grant is, um, is a challenge you about 
answering some questions, uh, you may know what the motivating rationale is. Uh, or, or maybe you didn't put it in there. Uh, I'll give you an example. We had a, um, a mentee last year and they had a very needy area and they made a great case for, um, for the program and their industry partners. And I said, you didn't mention that, that you know, um, 80 to 90% of your uh, population is on reduced lunch and, uh, and so needy and they go, well, everybody understands that. I'm like, no, everybody doesn't. You know, you, your readers could be from anywhere in the country. They don't know your section of the country. And so, um, so we'll, we'll point out those things so that you make sure that each section of your proposal um, uh, has uh, the background that will make the readers really understand the value of what you're proposing. So, so Peter posted a, a second part to his question, which is, are there any red flags when you're developing your budget? And um, first of all, your proposal will be reviewed by a panel of peers. So this is the National Science Foundation merit review process. The reviewers are told to rate your proposal based on the intellectual merit of the proposal. And there's a set of descriptors for that and the broader impacts, you know, which if you're doing anything in education, you automatically have a broader impact. Uh, another broader impact could be, as Kathy said, uh, a large percentage of people that will be impacted are, are low income. And this is something that, that could be used to increase the economic vitality of the region, as well as supporting these, your industry partners. So, so things like that, the, reviewer are, the reviewers are going to note. I, I always caution my reviewers, everybody follows the money right? We're, we're all going to do that. Um, but a reviewer should not base a rating on what they see in the budget. What they can do instead is, is raise a flag that says, you know, um, there's only one person listed as the PI, and this person is going to do everything on this project. We're, we're wondering, we panelists are wondering, um, can this person actually do this? Does this actually make sense? And oh, by the way, in the budget, they're only asking for one summer month of support over an entire, you know, one month. So it would be three months total over a three year project. This, this, this to us is something we think should be uh, discussed or negotiated. So things like that will come up. Um, you know, I, I also know from past experience uh, I would work on crafting a budget for a proposal that I wanted to submit. And the vice president of instruction at my institution would take the, the proposal from me and say, don't worry about the budget. I know how to fill out a budget. I know what I'm doing. And amazingly enough, it was always within one penny of the maximum budget allowable. And I would look at it and I would think, um, you know, um, there's a whole lot of padding in here that I, I didn't really think was, I don't think it's, it's needed. Well, guess what? Um, let's say it reviews really well through the intellectual merit and broader impacts. You'll get negotiation questions on your budget that will say, oh, you're asking for, um, uh, let's see, uh, $140,000 for X. Um, and in some cases, I could give you an example. In some cases, it would be a piece of equipment. And when the negotiation question is asked is, um, how often and when will students actually have, will be learning and have hands-on skills then for using that piece of equipment? And the person at times has responded back and said, um, oh, well, we're just going to let them walk through the lab and they'll look at it once every semester. Well, that's going to be something we're going to say, please take that out of your budget. You know, this is, this is an education project. If you want equipment, it's got to be equipment that students are going to be using. So things like that we, we do look at. Um, but remember, first, the first line is, what does your, your project description look like? You know, did you, did you meet those five points? Will somebody who doesn't know your institution or you um, understand what you're doing and how you're going to assess whether or not it's successful. Then a program officer will sort of pick apart your budget and may have uh, questions there. Again, if you can justify it to the program officer, 
um, I was, again, I was telling program officers this morning, um, use your judgment. You know, this is a little bit of a gray area. Um, uh, I think there was, there was an example of an, of an institution that wanted to purchase equipment. This is off-road equipment for a, for a project, um, but they wanted to involve multiple institutions. And so part of their equipment request, along with this, the, the actual off-road stuff, was a trailer to move it from institution A to institution B to institution C. And I said, well, you know, normally we don't support trailers, but one of the other program officers piped up and said, well, doesn't it make more sense to have a trailer to move things around than to have all three of those institutions asking for the, duplicating the same pieces of equipment? And I said, well, you know, that's, that's actually a pretty good rationale. Um, if you guys want to move forward with that, uh, I, I can't argue that one. So, so you want to think about things like that when you're thinking about crafting your budget. So Peter, Peter has another question. I don't know if you saw that, Celeste. Are there any industry sectors that are of particular interest to NSF ATE currently? So... So one of the things I really like about this pro program, and I think Liz would chime in here as well, is that the, the industry education partnerships is what really drives the ATE program. And if you think about different sectors of industry, be it, um, I don't know, we're, we're having a whole series on the bioeconomy and all of a sudden biotech is really hot at NSF. And I'm like, we've been doing biotechnology. I think the first ATE um, projects were funded in like 1987, you know, so we've been doing biotech for a long time. But the big thing is, is um, industry working with education drives that. I can't really think of a single industry occupation that does not get impacted by technological changes and innovations. Um, one of the centers we support is the center in welding. And you might say, what, welding? Uh, and others of you in the, it, it, that, that are listening might say, oh no, oh no, welding, there's a lot of, you know, there's new materials, there's, you know, how things are joined, there's all of these various things. So things that you don't really think about um, really are applicable to ATE as technology changes the skills and competencies that the industry is looking for in their employees. And so, so it's very broad. You know, we have everything from uh, that biotechnology to nanotech to all aspects of advanced manufacturing, supply chain, um, building innovations, you know, uh, there, there's uh, agriculture, um, huge amount of cybersecurity, information technology, right? You can kind of come up with a, any, a long laundry list, and I don't think there would probably be a single industry that we would say does not have the potential to be thinking about technology changes and, and, and needing that partnership with an educational institution to support their workforce. I, I think the thing I would add to that is just the focus needs to be on technician education. Right. So keep that in mind. Um, and then, so there was a question from Krista saying, can you tell us a little bit about a couple of recent su successful projects, small projects? So I don't know. I don't know, Liz. Would you like to chime in? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. The ones that we mentored. I mean, one of the ones I mentored last year was in Megatronics, and they were also a new institution, and um, you know, so they went through a lot of things. So that was one. They had lots of industry partners, um, but they had never done an ATE award before, and. I would say even at the, the preliminary thing they sent me to read, it was very rough and it was focusing more on STEM across the campus, really had nothing to do much with technician education. So even at the beginning stage, when we got the initial one page, he said, this needs to focus on technician education. And they realized it really, they really had like 70 um, industry partners to work with them in manufacturing who are asking for this megatronic thing. So I, I, that was one of the ones that was um, successful last year. Um, and while, let me say one other thing too about the uniqueness of MentorUp is that Mentor Connect focuses on new institutions. So if your institution has had an award, doesn't mean there aren't 
four other technician programs at your campus that might not be perfect things for the ATE program. Um, and in fact, it makes it more fun when there are more people across the campus. So I guess I would encourage you is um, if your institution has had an award in biotech, why not now look at cybersecurity or something? And that's a whole new group of faculty and a whole new area that needs it. So um, pass the word around that, you know, it's your institutions and at ones you talk to about um, don't, you know, lots of departments can help with an institution and some of the more successful colleges around have realized that um, if they start building kind of a culture of getting these, the faculty get excited, um, um, they realize you can work across campus. And so what was really good in cybersecurity now is going to impact your uh, manufacturing program. So I guess I'd encourage you to encourage people who had awards, doesn't mean they don't need some mentoring to mentor up to other their own projects or in other areas. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, oh good. I, I pushed a button. I wasn't sure I shut myself off. But um, I, I want to mention, uh, uh, Liz was talking about if you've had an ATE grant, you could go to MetterUp. Um, it, that doesn't eliminate you from uh, Matter Connect. There's a time limit, uh, uh, you know, as, as uh, we've said with the small new, uh, seven years, uh, I think, right now from the uh, beginning of the last grant. So um, it depends how long ago it was that you had an ATE grant. So you could still do Matter Connect if you meet that time limit. And as Liz said, maybe there's a whole different department that would like to, to come in and uh, it would be perfect for uh, Matter Connect. Um, but with uh, Men Are Up, uh, it, we, you don't have that time limit. So uh, again, we'll help you try to get the best fit depending on where you are with your, um, your project. Uh, I can mention another small uh, grant that is now in negotiations uh, for award and uh, you know was in a, a unique situation uh, that um, I, I've been helping with, but I'm kind of like the second mentor. There's a disciplinary mentor that we have working with her. And uh, she had no grants department. Uh, and um, in the early days of ATE, we found a lot of people we were helping that um, had no grants department, but, but now we find that people are building up and they, they're experienced. But even if you do, you know, you have nothing uh, there, uh, we will help you. And uh, for example, there, this person was in California, which I'm in, and uh, I uh, asked our college IRB uh, board if they could mentor them do their um, IRB, which was uh, uh, the review board that you need for any surveys uh, for an ATE project, and uh, and do it, and then train them uh, hopefully. And, and our, our our vice president was so nice of research, and she has mentored them uh, so that they can do it in the future, uh, but uh, all for free, uh, and uh, and which was great for this small. Uh, school because they were quoted two and three thousand dollars to do it from some universities and outside people. So um, we are a community. I, I don't know if we really emphasize that. ATE is, is a, just a great community to work with. And so we really do try to help. And if we can't help you, we pick up the phone and call someone we think might be able to help you. So, so Peter posted a question that Elaine Kraft should answer. <laughs> okay. Time, do you recommend to develop a competitive proposal? Elaine, do you want to say something? Are you still with us? Yeah, she's there. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. I was clicking on my picture where it said unmute, but that didn't work. I had to go somewhere else to get it to unmute. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my favorite uh, thing to, to say when somebody asks, I say that. Uh, crafting a truly strong competitive proposal is about like having a baby. It takes nine months to get it right. So um, essentially, you do need a lot of lead time, particularly if your faculty are, are essentially off in the summer, um, because that October deadline comes around very quickly after fall semester begins. And the first of fall semester is about as busy as it gets for anybody in two year colleges, maybe anywhere in higher ed. So um, getting that running start in the spring is, is very, very important. So uh, we like to see people start early in the new year and um, 
and then work um, towards that October deadline and wrap it up well in advance of the deadline because Murphy is alive and doing well and anything that can go wrong will go wrong as you try to submit your proposal at the 11th hour. <laughs> yeah, and that's another reason to have a mentor, uh, any of us, because uh, all of us have had frantic calls from people, including Celeste at the last minute, uh, where their uh, people are saying it won't go through or, uh, you know, all kinds of glitches. We, you know, we could we could just spend a whole webinar, I think, on what glitches could happen. Uh, so um, having a mentor who can say, all right, this is what you need to do, or I tell you about them and say, do it early, do it early. Because if it's an October deadline, uh, we, we tell people we do the June workshop, we have a lot of pre-work that you're doing, you're, you're ready to go, you're ready with sections of your proposal by that end of that June workshop, and by the time you start teaching in the fall, whenever that's going to be, and for some people that's the first or second week in August, we want you to pretty much have something we can read and and get feedback to because if you wait into September and and especially now where you're changing things to virtual that never were virtual before or hybrid, um, then you know you're not going to have the concentration and be able to have the, the polished proposal that you're going to need to be competitive. So, um, so yeah, I, I agree with uh, Elaine. The sooner you work on that uh, project, the better. And we're here to help. One other thing I'd like to say is though there are other mentoring projects, but the mentoring projects are working together. There are two of them that are not to mentor to do a proposal. There are two of them that are prepared to mentor you to even think about your technician programs at your college, okay, or a particular one or help get some of them. And so we're trying to be cognizant so that if another one would work better for you, we'll recommend you to a different one. So we are trying to make sure we understand, you know, the whole purpose of the ATE program. We're sharing resources with each other so that if uh, one project has some resources that has been developed by another, we can share those resources too. So um, I think it's important that we're working together. We meet like every other month, right? And so make sure we're kind of staying up to. So Peter has another question. It says, what are your thoughts or cautions or benefits regarding collaborative projects across several colleges? Do we have any examples? So, so I, I think I, could, I can probably take that one. Um, th there, there's, there's two different ways of thinking about working across different institutions. There's two ways to craft a proposal. Um, one is that Institution A is the lead. And within Institution A's budget, under the subheading of subawards, are institutions that are named that are going to be subawardees and have specific roles and responsibilities. Okay. That's one way to do a collaborative project. It means, though, that the fiscal lead Institution A really has control of those funds, okay? So if subawardee B doesn't turn in what they were supposed to turn in on time and says, well, we're just not gonna get it done, but give us our money anyway, institution A can say, I'm so sorry, you didn't deliver your, the, the, your, your product, so you're not going to get any money. And that works. So there's another way to craft a proposal, which would be, a true collaborative where there's one 15 page description, but each institution that is involved submits their own separate budget. So in that case, that, that institution that didn't deliver, they get their money anyway. So, so there's, there's, there's sort of pluses and minuses about, about those two ways of crafting um, a proposal. Uh, sort of beyond that kind of thinking, um, I think you, you, you know, you want to have a pretty good idea that you have the right set of people at both institutions to carry out the activities. I, I know, um, you know, I've been, I've been thinking a lot lately, especially in, well, gosh, it, it would work in the, it would work in the um, efficient sort of construction efficiency and management area as well. Uh, the, the needs for understanding sort of cybersecurity 
and how it impacts things that are going on in a smart building. You know, not just that the person can come in and knows how to program and make sure that everything's working right. What do you do if somebody hacks into a building and shuts everything down? You know, what would somebody need to know about something like that? Well, maybe you've got the, the smart building program, but a, an institution close to you has a really good cybersecurity program and you might wanna work together to develop, to develop modules uh, jointly that potentially could influence both institutions. So it's, it's kind of like, what's the, you know, what is your idea? Does it make sense to reach out and work with other people at a different institution? Or would it be better to, you know, to do things in, 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 a, in a different way? And, and we get all kinds of proposals uh, within the ATE program. Um, I, I do know that there was one institution that um, uh, came in with that colla true collaborative proposal. And um, they were a very small part of this collaborative. And then they submitted a small new to ATE. Well, unfortunately, um, it didn't work because when we looked it up in the awards database, they actually were listed as having an award. It wasn't very much money, but it knocked them out of the small new competition, that track. So, she, you know, there's, and that's one of those things where mentors can help with that. All of us as program officers here at the National Science Foundation are always willing to respond to questions. Um, we can help out there as well. Uh, that was the first time that one had come up. So, and I felt really bad for the, for the institution that hadn't realized that by doing it as a collaborative that way, they actually just knocked themselves out of being able to come into the small new track. But um, you know, that, that kind of thing can happen. Yeah, I, and if I can uh, throw in just one more thing on uh, uh, the choices between uh, doing it as people as a sub award or as a, a collaborative, uh, speaking from experience as a long time uh, principal investigator of a center uh, create in California, uh, in, that uh, it's so much better to uh, have it uh, people as a sub award. As Celeste said, uh, you have more control to say, okay, uh, you're supposed to be doing this task. Have you done this? Have you, uh, and if they haven't, you, you're not sending the money. The collaborative, they have the money. What, what incentive? And, you know, you don't have both carrot and stick anymore. And, uh, and so uh, it, it really is helpful because you as principal investigator want to get that good collaborative project uh, together and you want everybody to be doing their part. And sometimes maybe somebody leaves and, uh, and, and so you're stuck with uh, having a task undone. You don't want to do that. So um, just from experience, uh, you know, uh, Peter, I see says, what are the cautions? My caution is don't get into that with a collaborative. Uh, some of the universities do that uh, more often, but not as much the community colleges. It, you're much better off doing a, a proposal and sub awards. Uh, so anyway, that's my two cents. Okay, we got we got another question from um, Krista, I believe. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm clicking on the wrong thing. I got it. Have you had submissions from a single institution with their academic credit bearing side partnering with workforce development? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, yes, but realize that uh, one of the things that ATE requires is that um, the programs that you develop around workforce development need to be credit bearing. And, and I, get, I get this question a lot where people will say, but you know, we have, you know, we've got, we've got a whole nother side and we do these non-credit courses. And I go, I really understand it. I'm, I'm from a community college. I, I do understand it. And, and when students would come to me and they would say, um, what's the difference between your um, five unit uh, molecular biology course and the one that's going to cost me uh, $1,800 if I take it during the, during the, uh, during the summer for, you know, fr from, the, from the school, but not taught with, 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 with faculty. It would be, that's, that part of the school has the ability to hire whoever they want to teach it. And I would say, well, the first thing is, is um, there's a really big difference between paying that much money for a course that you're getting in the summer and doing one where you're going to get um, a lot more time in the lab with, you know, with hands-on stuff. But how about the price? 
Um, at that time, the unit um, price was $13 a unit at Foothill. So, um, so for five times $13, um, you got, a, a, and you got a whole lot more hours of actually being in the lab and, and learning about the different techniques and things. So, um, you can, it, I would, I would definitely say it would be great to work between the two. It's one of the things that NSF, I, I talk about a lot with the people who are from four-year institutions, that there's a real sort of culture divide between the workforce development side a lot of times and the STEM transfer programs. <clears throat> and it's always something that's difficult for the, for the four-year faculty who are at NSF to really understand. But I, I understand, I know, I know it's a real, it's a real, uh, it can be a real problem. All right, we only have two more minutes. Do we have any more questions? Well, with that, you had a lot of great questions there in the chat, and uh, we really appreciate you coming uh, for this talk, and I've recorded it, so uh, I will make the recording available to Peter as soon as I get it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you to all our presenters. Yep. Thank, thank you. you thank, to you. thank you, everybody. Yep. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Stay good night. safe. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.